All right, everyone, welcome back to our second part of our oral pharmaceuticals course today. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Blumenstein is a 1990 graduate of the University of California, Los Angeles with a degree in biology. He got his OD degree from the New England College of Optometry in 1994. Then he completed a residency in secondary ophthalmic care at the Barnett Delaney Eye Center in Phoenix, Arizona. He is also a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a founding member of the Optometric Council on Refractive Technology. Currently, Dr. Blumenstein is at the Schwartz Laser Eye Center, which is in Phoenix, Arizona, and he's the president of the board of the American Optometric Charitable Foundation. Again, everyone knows Dr. Blumenstein as an incredible leader and expert in dry eye and anterior segment. So I am super excited to hear from you on a topic I've never heard you speak about before, but I'm sure is going to be fabulous. So Dr. Blumenstein, welcome back to Wuyu. Thanks, Stephanie. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, with that intro, I feel uh, I feel a lot of pressure. So I might have to take my hoodie off at some point. But uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, happy Sunday for those of you on the west side, like myself here. Um, it's it's earlier, and for the East Coasters, I know I'm digging into your uh, time for uh, um, football. So here's my financial disclosures. Nothing exciting. I you know I don't. I don't get paid for anything, so it's all good. So, so I mean, all relevant um, relationships have been mitigated. So, let's get started. Pain, pain management in optometric practice. You know, uh, this was a, a, a topic that um, I wrote about, God, years ago. Um, it was with uh, Steve Frucci and I. We wrote an article back in Review of Optometry in 2012 talking about how we can manage pain within our practices, um, within our patients. And the interesting thing about that is, is that um, over the last, I'd say, 10 years, a, a lot has changed and a lot kind of has stayed the same. You know, we, we talk about using orals in um, the optometric practice. And to be quite sincere with you, I, I think they're very limited in their necessity. Um, in fact, I would oftentimes tell anybody that will listen, if you have to reach for an oral medication, then maybe you might not be doing something right. You know, because when we think about the indications, when we start thinking about, you know, managing pain here in and around that, um, then what you need to basically do is think about, you know, something that we're going to give our patients relief within 24 to 36 hours. And, and I, I say that um, with earnest and sincerity. And I, it's, I don't know, you know, I, I had a patient who I saw on when, was it when, um, Wednesday, um, came in bright, steamy, hot red eye. And the other one, I was hot, red, steamy. It was tearing, um, no mucus discharge. When I walked in the room, my first thought was she had the rage. Um, you know, if anybody's seen the movie 28 Days Later, um, yeah, I thought she had the rage. Um, or I'm like, heavy case of the vid or something. And so she proceeds to tell me that she had gone to her primary care doctor. Her primary care doctor looked at her and basically said, I can't help you. You need to go somewhere else. So I gloved up, went in, saw her, um, you know, some follicles down there, but her eyes were burning. She had just a tremendous amount of um, just like stabbing pain in her eyes as she described it. Now, does anybody, you know, we could do a differential diagnosis right now. Can anybody think about what they think it is? And yeah, exactly, a bug bite. Why is it whenever there's a red eye, somebody always inevitably says, um, was it a bug bite? Yeah, who are those people? I mean, I, I don't, I mean, we don't really have bugs here. We have spiders in Arizona, but uh, no, it was not a bug bite. Okay. So whoever, whoever thought it was a bug bite, you're wrong. So the, the um, bug bite basically, um, it was not a bug bite. It was EKC. I mean, it was, to me, it was obviously hemorrhagic EKC, which is, in itself, disconcerting. I mean, because when you make that viral uh, diagnosis, you're kind of making a viral diagnosis predicated on the fact that it just doesn't really 
look or kind of feel like a bacterial infection. So, you know, I, I literally told this young lady, I said, look, I go, I go, traditionally, we never even had any treatments. We didn't do anything we could do to help you. It was palliative. It was like, you know, it's like, you're going to be okay. You know, verbal Valium and verbal Valium is an oral optometric um, prescription. So remember that. Okay. Just reinforcing things, letting patients know, told her, started her on some Zergan, put her on some artificial tears, told her to put them in the refrigerator. That's another great pain reliever um, is to have your patients use an artificial tear. Put it in the, in the, in the ice box, if you shall, uh, in the cooler. Um, and so when they drop it in their eyes, it, it feels a little more soothing, kind of like uh, an ice pack. Anyways, long and the short of it is, is that I also gave her non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, as you shall see. We're going to talk about that in a few seconds. And the truth of the matter is, is that uh, I really thought I did a phenomenal job preparing her. So Friday afternoon comes around, I look at my schedule, and there's a name on there that kind of vaguely seems familiar. And yeah, sure enough, two days later, she's called, and she's in the office because her eye, guess what, still hurts and still bothers her, and it's still red. And she's like, so... I mean, my, my feeling always is, is that for us, our goal is to do everything we can to alleviate discomfort to, it, it almost kind of in a small sense, I think, gives our patients a, a general sense of confidence that we know what we're doing. Uh, topically, you know, we can use cycloplegias, we use topical NSAIDs and bandage lenses. And I think, you know, other um, optometric indications, obviously, for us, for our patients, trauma or abrasions, you know, foreign bodies, um, patients that come in with a traumatic hyphema where they have a lot of discomfort, as well as our post-refractive cataract, retinal, any, any post-patient who has, I mean, listen, any inflammation, any indication where there's a breach on the cornea, uh, your patients are going to have some form of discomfort. And I know, you know, I, I too, am, I, I fall in this trap of wanting to you know, prescribe to the level that we're at. It's like, you know, the minute we got oral antibiotics in Arizona, if somebody, shoot, if I heard a sneeze, I was like, um, Z-Pack? Do you want me to get you Z-Pack? I'm on it, right? You know, any, anything that we can do just to be like, yo, yo, I can take care of you. And I think this is one indication where having the ability to prescribe, you know, uh, an oral medication, especially for, for pain, is one that I would tell you to reserve. You know, keep that keep that bullet. You know, kind of back a little bit. You know, uh, make it make it your last resort, if you will. You know, when we start thinking about dealing with pain in our practice, we have to basically figure out the etiology of it. And I know sometimes, you know, we do have some patients that are a pain. And the etiology of them is for them to just leave our practices. And, and I feel you, my friends. And, you know, a good way of doing that still in my heart and mind is to prescribe Acular. Um, it's a non anti-inflammatory, as we'll talk about. Um, it burns like a mofo. So, you know what? Your patients are going to hate you, and they probably won't want to come back. So that's one way of getting rid of our patients. But the other thing, too, is, is that, you know, you find out the frequency, the onset. You know, how, how long is it lasting? Is there anything associated with it? Have you done anything to make it feel better? Um, and more importantly, um, you know, has this ever happened in the past is my, one of my, my biggest questions I always ask patients. And I think especially when you're dealing with a, an abrasion or erosion, those questions come up. Or oftentimes, too, it's like you're dealing with something and then it's like, wow, you know, and then it's like, well, could this be because I had this? And it's like, what? Help, help me out, help me to help you um, is really, really what we need with these patients. Something else that's really important that I don't think we do enough is especially, you know, your staff or yourself is to assess the level of pain before initiating the treatment. You know, you can use a numerical scale or you can use like the Wong Baker scale. You know, when you're using a numerical scale, something that it works really well. And this is something that we do a lot in clinical trials is we basically will take a, um, it's one, uh, 10 centimeters. So what is it? A hundred, hundred millimeters, right? Did I do the math right? Yeah. Um, and so you have a 10 centimeter line and you have zero, no pain 
and you have 10 severe pain or something better. What you could do is you could say 10, no pain, zero severe pain. Boom. Just to mess with them to see if they're listening. I do that all the time. I'd be, I'd be like, Jill on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being, you know, I'm the worst husband and zero. You love me with all your heart. Where am I? And she'll be like a nine. And I'm just like, wow, it's hard. It's hurtful. Um, but then it's like, no, I wasn't listening. And then again, it becomes hurtful because then I realize she doesn't listen to me either. These are tricks that we can play with our patients. You know what else is another really good trick for your patients? And this is something I picked up from Sandra Black back in the day, um, is when you want them to read something on a near point card, oftentimes we'll hand it to them where we want them to read it. A better rule of thumb is to kind of drop it and go, whoops, okay, and then turn it upside down and hand it to them. And what they have to do is they have to turn it back up and they usually will adjust it to where they can read it. And then you can kind of see their, where they see it. Yeah, those are little tricks. To me, another, you know, opportunity here is you put that line without putting the hash marks and just say, you know, where would you assess your pain and have them draw it. And if, as long as it's 10 centimeters, then, or, then you'll basically, is it 10? One centimeter, one centimeter, 100 millimeters. Um, they'll be able to see exactly what it is. Okay. You know, the, the Wong Baker pain scale is good if you're in a pediatric practice. I also think this one's just fun anyway, because then, you know, you just basically just to have patients to be able to say, how do you feel right now? Right. Do, do you, do you look like that, that kind of yellowish orangey guy, right? Where it's a little difficult to concentrate. Maybe it interferes with the ability to do certain normal activities, such as reading or watching TV. And, and you know, why these are important is because when you go back, you want to be able to demonstrate that it's getting better. Or better yet, sometimes patients' pain scales are not what we perceive them to be. You know, we'll have somebody say, oh, my pain is, you know, off the charts. But then when you show them a Wom Baker, they're like, you know, oh, it's like a four, the little, you know, kind of angry face. It's not like super sad face going across there. So, I don't know, highlighted area. I think someone's trying to tell me something, but I don't know. So, okay. So before treatment, all right, we start thinking about, um, I'm still trying to find it here. Is it an app? Do you think it's one of the apps? No, it's not an app. I hit apps. No, don't believe see that. No, still can't figure out. I will do it. I promise. Okay. So before treatment with any of these patients, you know, Pregnancy, alcohol use, antidepressants are always going to be important when, you know, prescribing medications. You need to know your patient's drug history, right? Whether they're on some CNS medications, whether they're on Coumadin, Digoxin, or what over-the-counter treatments um, these patients are doing also. Now, um, for all intensive purposes, um, you want to look at the allergy history as well. And the, the thing about allergy history, if I can go back for a second, um, for allergy history, there's a huge difference between talking to patients about a true allergic reaction versus patients that have, um, that says, um, oh, now I lost it all together. People are trying to help me and it's like, Transcribe. No, I see annotate. I don't see transcribe anywhere. Yeah, I don't understand what, how I did that. Okay. But let's get back to allergy. Okay. So allergy is, um, there's a difference between allergy to a medication and sensitivity. I kind of like that transition. So if you guys are with me, um, if anybody's actually paying attention, um, uh, I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am, the way it kind of goes back and forth, is that allergy is when you truly have like a, almost like a Stevens Johnson response. You have this immune uh, directed response um, that is going to, you know, uh, cause grief. And, you know, basically uh, could be life threatening for all intents and purposes. And people who have true allergic reactions like allergies to penicillin know this. I think oftentimes, you know, we have uh, sensitivities and a sensitivity is when you have like a side effect. Um, like, you know, your throat gets dry or tightens or, you know, maybe you, your heart races a little bit or you get diarrhea. Um, you know, uh, that's not an allergy. That's a sensitivity. Um, you know, I, I tell this story and I, and if anybody 
of the, you know, 500 or so of you that are on here or 800 or a thousand, however many people are on here, um, probably have heard me tell you that you can really define who is kind of a, a, an out there patient by the power of threes, right? So this is a really, really good way of just looking at your patients and just saying, oh, you're crazy, okay? Because we, we all have them, okay? We all do. Um, and literally one of those is um, you look at their rings, okay? How much jewelry they have. Do they have more than three or more pieces of jewelry on one hand? Boom, okay? So you can talk to them, but they're not listening. Those are the ones where you say, which is better, one or two? And they say, is there a three? And it's like, I, I, I would have offered that, yeah. The second thing is um, how many allergies they profess to have to systemic medications. If they say they have three or more allergies to medications, yeah, no. I mean, the, it's like less than a 5% chance of being allergic to a reaction to anything. So having multiples like that is just really uncommon. The third one's cats, but I don't, I don't really want to get into three or more cats. So I also think bumper stickers, things hanging from the rearview mirror. Um, I think, uh, you know, stuffed animals in the back of their car. You know, when we start talking about pain um, and discomfort. I, I think we can't not, as optometrists right now, um, forget about neurotrophic keratitis and corneal neuropathic pain. And I think oftentimes for us, we want to reach for maybe an oral medication or something um, significant for these patients when they have these types of conditions. When you think of a, a neurotrophic keratitis, it's essentially patients look great and feel awful. And that oftentimes to me is the biggest challenge. I mean, I want to go in and I want to drop it like it's hot. I want to be able to go, look, there's a, there's a lash poking you in the eye. Or you know what I, I, I see? And when you see patients that have NK, you don't see that. And, I, and I, I'm emphasizing NK a little bit because this is one of those, those challenges that we have, right? We have this stain without pain on our neurotrophic keratitis patients. We have patients that come in who just look like crap, so it's kind of like the opposite. It's everything we think it shouldn't be, and yet it is. We get damage to their corneal nerves, leading to the breakdown of this, the epithelial, the epithelial tissue, which in turn causes significant changes. And I, I think it's important to focus on this for a few seconds. Um, you know, we have an hour and 40 minutes, people, so just relax, okay? Because there's only about 65,000 people in the United States that are affected by uh, neurotrophic keratitis, but it is a progressive condition. And so to me, you know, it has to have a start and it has to have an end. And where does it start is in patients that have maybe non-significant issues, right? Or maybe just mild types of problems, right? The cornea is the most powerful pain generator in the body. Remember that, you know, we're talking about ocular pain, right? 7,000 nerve terminals per millimeter. And the corneal nerves we know mainly originate from the ophthalmic division of the cranial nerve five, you know, the nasal ciliary branch, which branches off there, then divides into the long ciliary around the limbus and enters the midstromal. We also have these non, or these nociceptive of stimuluses, like free nerve endings. And what's important about those are th these can be triggered by um, cold, um, so like temperature, um, um, whether it be heat or cold or smell, um, toxic. So, you know, I sometimes think we lose sight of the fact that patients may have pain in their eyes that is not necessarily related to, you know, something on the eye itself. Okay. When we think about neurotrophic, um, oh, look, I forgot this, or neuropathic pain perception, um, it's itch, irritation, dryness, grittiness, burning, aching, all of the things that kind of describe that kind of early dry eye type patient. And yet we're looking at them and we're not seeing a significant amount of this. You know, the, the nerve malfunction is the hallmark of NK. And we see that, that conditions that damage the trigeminal nerve can disrupt the physiological process. And all of these things are important because as we damage the nerves, then we make them work irregularly. And we make our patient's pain perception irregular as well. So those, those um, uh, diminished protective blinks that our patients are getting then in turn can lead to more inflammation and more irritation. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a vicious cycle. 
we have free flowing on the outside of our eye, these endogenous neural growth factors. They maintain corneal integrity. Um, they basically help keep the cornea innervated. So having a good, healthy neural growth factor inside the eye um, basically means that the nerves themselves um, are, are basically propagating and doing well. We also see that they proliferate and differentiate, but they also help with tear secretion. So, you know, keep that in your back pocket that, you know, neural growth factors is, is really important. And these things, you know, talking about pain and sensation, you know, we can take these back to the, to the TFOS, um, to the do do, um, cause it was done in Paris. So, and it was two, so it was do do. Um, and to be honest with you, that should be a reminder. This could be where you could put this report to read it because it's long. So just remember, do do um, TFOS pain and sensation report. When we think of conditions that lead to NK, I, I really want to kind of focus a little bit on this. And I apologize that I have bio tissue down in the lower corner there. Um, is that uh, diabetes to me has got to be one of those things when you're looking at patients and talking and treating discomfort, pain, irritation in the eyes. Remember, I, I like to describe to patients about what we're seeing with diabetes because you, you talk about true systemic conditions. You know, it, it, if you think about what is happening uh, kind of on a very, you know, kind of gross scale here is that the oxygen is basically not getting to the tissue it needs to. And what I always tell patients who are diabetic is that, you know, your, your blood is thick. Okay. It's, it's, got too much sugar in it it makes it very viscous so i can't get the little oxygen to the small tissues that it needs to like the eyes or the bottom of your feet or your pancreas your kidney places where there's spine blood vessels and lots of oxygen is needed because there's so much traffic in the blood flow because your blood has gotten sticky from the sugar um it doesn't get there in time and then what happens is your body says i need more oxygen so then you get swelling or inflammation because the eyes are irritated and then, or, or the body's irritated. Then it brings new blood vessels and those blood vessels leak. And so, you know, this term of neuropathy or opathy in and around diabetes, I think, I think we as a collectively as a profession could do a phenomenal job in helping describe that for our patients and discuss it for our patients. And the main reason why I say that is because it really reinforces why we need to look in the back of their eyes. And more importantly, you know, why a lot of the changes that they're have that are going to happen or they're, they're experiencing can be related back to, you know, the, this oxygen level and inflammation and being proactive in treating these patients. You know, some other conditions that can, can lead to this, whether it be amyloidosis or, you know, vitamin A deficiency. Um, you know, I think for us, you know, diabetes is, is going to be right on the top there. You know, some other issues that can cause, you know, some NK is patients that have uh, aneurysms or stroke. We see it in post-neurological procedures, um, patients that have had, um, you know, some, some cranial type of, of, of surgery or even sometimes, oftentimes, uh, in and around the, the facial aspect of uh, those nerves. So be on the lookout for things like that. And there are also some genetic conditions like Riley Day or Mobius syndrome um, that may or may not cause um, some early signs of NK. But other things that we need to really be conscious of, and this kind of goes back to our discussion here about pain, um, is patients that have post um, herpes keratitis. Um, whether it be zoster or simplex, when you look at patients that are contact lens wearers, um, you know, uh, certain corneal dystrophies or even the abuse of topical anesthetics. That's a good one. Is that not a good one? Yeah, that's a good one because we're going to talk about that if we get to it. Um, moreover, you know, the one thing I guess that I'm kind of coming to here is that you need to basically test for it. Now, if you have patients that just you see things that just don't look like they should, or conversely, patients have overt amount of discomfort when you just don't think they should. You know, a qualitative way of basically doing this is to just do the cotton wisp test. Um, my good friend, Dr. Doug DeVries, Dougie Doug, Dougie Fresh up in Reno, he likes to use um, 
dental floss. So what he'll do is take that old school waxy dental floss, he'll snip off a piece, he'll take his forceps, and he'll just come to the eye. And you want to basically just you know measure it in, in all four quadrants. What I'll do is have a patient look straight ahead. I'll come at them with my cotton tip applicator with just a little wisp, little wisp, and I'll touch you know temporally, inferiorly, superiorly, and nasally. And again, going back to like our, our scale, zero to ten. Where would you assess, you know, how much you can feel this, okay? And a patient was like, feel what? Yeah, I think we know where we're at. And then you do the other eye. So even if you think it's one eye, you're going to do both eyes. Now, quantitatively, there's a thing called the Cochette Bonnet Estesimer. I can pronounce it. Do I have a picture of it? No, I thought I had a picture of it. Um, literally, it's a device that has a thread coming through it. And you basically push it onto the eye and it basically will kind of, it's, it's almost kind of like a, um, um, like a measuring tape. And as you keep pushing to try to fill the pain, it's going to go further in there and it gives you basically a quantifiable way using this little filament um, to describe exactly how much there is. And I, I think that's, that for our purposes, that's just not necessary. And the other thing that is necessary, though, is when you think about the stages. There's a way of staging this. There's the Mackey um, classification system. And this, for all intents and purposes, is a, a pretty generic way of looking at it. You have stage one, which is, uh, you know, punctate keratitis. And oftentimes, a lot of our patients have punctate keratitis. But if you have it where it just isn't going away, not getting better, you're not getting any relief. Stage two is those persistent epithelial defects. And stage three is when we start to get ulceration. And this is when talking about pain, we think they should have pain. So here's kind of this progression. And I know we've said there's only about 65,000 people that have, you know, NK, but that's when I think we're really getting to that stage two, stage three. How many of these patients are early on in the stage one? I think a better way is there was this staging group that got together and they said, you know, we need to kind of change a, a different way of looking at this, you know, epithelial optic without stromal haze, adding in that kind of hazy stroma that we see with our patients as a step two and step three, the recurrent erosion, maybe some uh, um, stromal scarring and edema. So I think, you know, you can expand this however you want to, right? But here's, you know, kind of some, some, some good pictures here. You can see the, the, the significant amount of staining significant amount of listening staining that's going on as well on the cornea and the, the patient base is like yo i'm good i'm fine it's like i no, you're not okay so we start talking about management the management is is all the things that we're going to be talking about especially with discomfort um as well as one of the medications that's been approved by the fda you know here's a, a case uh, from scott houseworth a uh, really, really smart guy up in Denver. Um, you know, Scott basically had a 71-year-old female, 18-month history of dry eye. And has been seeing all kinds of doctors, right? You know, everybody's like not helping her. Symptoms are basically burning, moderate photophobia, right? That, that vague kind of like, you know, discomfort that our patients are getting. And they were on everything you can think of and nothing's helped. You know, so what would you expect to see with a patient who's complaining like that? You know, you expect to see all kinds of crazy crap, you know, when the reality is, you know, we see nothing. So keep that in your pocket because, you know, there's little correlation between signs and symptoms. And symptoms may correlate with signs, but most of us basically only treat according to symptoms. And so, you know, as we talk about this one symptom of discomfort and pain, um, we can't forget the fact that sometimes that's misleading, right? Waiting for that. Now, corneal neuralgia is defined as pain that is in the distribution of the nerve or set of nerves with current signs of nerve damage. And, you know, because the cornea is the most sensitive tissue in the body, it's like having a toothache that's magnified. And so neuropathic pain and dry eye, we either have hyperglesia, which is an increased sensitivity to feeling of pain, extreme response to pain. Um, they might have, you know, pain due to a stimulus that does not normally provoke pain, like, huh, you know, or they might have just that, that photophobia. And so we kind of see all of these in neuropathic pain, okay? And then we can kind of differentiate between whether it's, you know, Oh, I'm not going to play that video. Whether there's, you know, central pain versus um, peripheral um, nervous system. 
But neuropathic pain is damage and inflammation. It results in peripheral accidental uh, injuries. It releases inflammation. Those inflammatory mediators result in increased sensitivity to the peripheral sensitivity. So it, it almost kind of can be starting central and moving peripherally with these patients. You know, it's a hallmark, actually I should go back, the, the hallmark of central sensitization is pain that is disconnected from ongoing peripheral signs. So what ends up happening is over time, um, you know, the central neurons basically become really, really responsive or over-responsive, heightened responsive um, to, to pain and discomfort, and our patients become super aware of it um, as well. And these just become way more challenging. You know, uh, th those, those noce receptors um, basically start just anything that even gets close to it. Um, the perception of that pain um, is significant. You know, so dry eye damages peripheral neuropathies, causes inflammation, causes peripheral sensitization, causes central sensitization, which causes thalamus, causes central pain, and guess what? It starts all over again. So it's this vicious cycle. So if you if you look at this this kind of um, pain cycle, it's like where do we insert ourselves to kind of make this better? Okay. Something else that I really want you to also remember is we keep talking about these these you know. Um, um, temperature um, um, and as well as touch um, and heat. So you have heat, pain receptors, temperature receptors, and these are these TRP8s receptors. And there's a company um, that has been working in a phase two clinical trial to basically kind of numb these a little bit or change them. But if you see here, what's, what's one of the ways to activate that temperature one is to use methanol menthol methanol menthol um and it's interesting is that there has been a study um this was done by alice epitropolis um and alice and her crew basically went in and um what and basically what they did is um use roto which is menthol so what you're doing is you're basically kind of activating those trp8 uh, receptors, which in turn is kind of like numbing the eye a little bit, if you will, which is kind of cool. So what Alice did was, you know, especially patients that have, um, they say, burning or irritation in their um, their eyes from, let's say, putting in a drop. So let's just use, their, their example was using it for patients that are on Zydra or patients that were on, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, restasis or patients that were on um, Sequa, Sequa, and they're, oh, it burns, it burns so bad, or I can't use this, is if you put Roto, or Roto, Roto, yeah, if you put that in first, then you put the drop in, because you've now activated this TRPA channels, the patients don't feel it. So, <clears throat> this, is, this is another good way to kind of, you know, help kind of numb the pain. So yes, I know Stephanie like, you know, hyped up the whole oral aspect of it. And I really do appreciate that. And so um, I still don't know how to get rid of the annotation things on the bottom, but as long as nobody's, nobody's upset about it. Um, now you can, everybody can just turn the volume down and read it. So you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, we still need to talk about topical pain relief. I mean, because that's 90% of what we do. And one of the, you know, and, and I've kind of this lead up to the discussion we've been having is really that dealing with pain is, is, is kind of challenging just from the perspective of differentiating where it's coming from, you know, doing your foldar, assessing it from your patient, and then everything you think when you see it in your patient's eyes, it's contrary to what you potentially think it might be. You know, you see pain without stain, and then you see, it's, you know, no stain with pain. So it kind of can go both ways. And I think I said the same thing twice, and you're welcome again. You know, we think about topical pain relievers. Don't forget about cycloplegics, okay? You know, if I can emphasize this, you know, they, they block the acetylcholine, um, which is a stimulator for the neurotransmitter of the uh, um, nervous system. You know, it's, it also causes pupillary dilation and relaxation of the ciliary body. Um, so what we're doing is we're basically kind of breaking down some spasms. We're shutting down that blood aqueous, 
decreasing inflammation. So I think, again, you know, if you tell patients what to expect, then they know what, they know what's going to happen. If you wait for something to happen, and then your patient's going to think it's a complication. So I think it's important, you know, especially when you're talking about using any medication or anything you're going to challenge these patients with is, is, is let them know what to expect. I'm going to put a, I'm going to dilate your pupils. I'm doing that not because I want to dilate them because you annoy me and I want to look in the back of your eye. I'm doing them because X, Y, Z. What I always tell patients is because as the, the um, iris um, opens, what it does is it shuts down some of those uh, blood barriers. And so basically it decreases the inflammation in the eye, which in turn causes pain. So, you know, give your patients a, a, a whiff of, you know, what's in it for me. We started thinking about the tropical or topical pain relievers like cycloplegics. Good luck, people. You know, good luck finding these. You know, it's, they're hard to find. I mean, my go-to obviously would be home atropine, you know, two, 5%. Um, I, I don't really usually go any lower than, than QID um, for, for most of these patients. Um, you know, if you're going into hardcore atropine or scopolamine, um, it's just not necessary. Um, you can um, but from a pain perspective, maybe an iritis perspective, but not from a pain. Don't forget about our topical pain relievers. Okay? When we think about you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory pain relievers, we have inhibition of the, um, the, the COX <clears throat> cyclooxygenase, um, which we know kind of you know, uh, is, is that classic triad, if you will. We can reduce the inflammation. We can manage a little bit of pupil dilation, but there's an analgesic effect in reducing some of those those prostomites that are kind of like synthesizing um, within that damaged area. Um, you know, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, that we see here, um, especially you know, ketorolac or bronfenac. I think I think bronfenac, um, or you know, is probably right now the most recognizable non steroidal anti-inflammatory um you know acular um is you know pretty much can get a product basically almost over the counter right now um but you know we still also have uh, uh what is it uh <clears throat> excuse me a levro you can probably get some from some of your drug reps but you know i mean a non steroidal anti-inflammatory i remember back in the day too when there was the generic non steroidal anti-inflammatories that were causing problems um for a lot of our patients i think we're, we're way past that and so feel comfortable using these you know again there's that verbal volume that we talk about you know especially with patients that have uh conditions that are going to heal on their own you know like an abrasion um like a um you know, somebody who has uh, SPK or a Delin or um, somebody who has a penetrating injury, maybe not so quickly, um, but, you know, and even still around like herpetic infections as well. You know, it's a really good option for your patients to help them with that discomfort without having to worry or be challenged by um, long-term use of medications. I, I personally, I, I like Prolenza um, uh, for no other reason. It's once a day. Um, it's QD. Um, the bromsite, you know, Prolenza is from Bausch Plus Lam. Bromsite is something that you find from some pharmaceuticals. Um, the the bromsite comes in a thicker um, agent. Um, it uses the the, the duras. No, it's not durasol. It's um, duracite. So duracite is this polyadhesive mucus kind of like uh, vehicle, which is nice. Because when you put it on the eye, it basically lingers on there, holds on there, hold, holds, holds on there longer so they get more relief. Um, but uh, I've had really good results with the Prolenza, and I, I like the once a day. Although, I, as I say that too, though, I do oftentimes think if your patients are putting in, um, you know, let's say a steroid or they're putting in um, something else on top of that, then... I do up it sometimes, and mainly because I feel that if you say, oh, do this one once a day, but do this one four times a day, and this one four times a day, they forget about it. So I usually will maybe pace it uh, twice a day for those patients. So some steroid options, you know, um, you know, here are the states, and I, I realize that we have some people from Canada on here because somebody just asked me if something's available in Canada. 
Um, that's fantastic, eh? So I will, um, for, for a little bit here, uh, about, you know, a few minutes or so, I'll talk Canadian for my Canadian friends there. Um, howdy. So the first steroid to receive an indication for post-operative pain uh, here in the States, you know, was, uh, um, was the Durazol. Um, we mentioned before, <clears throat> just a few seconds ago, about Duracite. Uh, which is the vehicle, but uh, this was first approved here uh, about 10 years ago, give or take, um, you know, and it's it's a pretty active drug. I mean, you know, uh, I, I hold back Durazol for the really significant inflammation, really significant amount of discomfort because you worry about those ancillary side effects that are associated with this. But my Canadian friend um, who just uh, commented about Roto, and I'm not sure if you can, I, I you know, uh, I'm answering a question that was on there because I keep trying to still figure out how to get rid of the uh, the words that keep popping up at the bottom. Um, and nobody has said, Mark, you suck. I can't do this um, because of the words. You might be saying that because of other stuff. Or maybe it is because of the words because the words are coming out of my mouth. But I just meant the words that are being typed. Um but anywho, what I was going to say is that uh, um, the, my Canadian friend here, and we are friends. Did, did, have I ever told you guys this story about a patient that I had years ago where I walked in and go, all right, my friend, and she looked at me and she goes, we're not friends. And I'm like, stop it. Come on. Yes, we are. And then, yeah. And so I went out of my way every time I saw that woman to like make sure she realized that uh, we were friends. And she did everything she could to make sure she realized she hated me. So... It was a win-win. It was a win-win all the way across the board there. But um, they had said, since we don't get Roto, and I don't know if you don't, because if I can digress for two seconds, right now here in the States, we have a brand new um, over-the-counter tier product. And guess what it's called? It's called Ivisia. Okay? And Ivisia is a pretty cool. And if you've never tried Ivisia, um, again, to me, what I probably should have said at the very beginning of this is when somebody says they have pain, your first thought should be, let's lubricate the eye more because that's just, you know, simple and easy. Avisia is a over-the-counter artificial tear. It's from Taya, um, French company that's come to the States, family-owned, really fantastic. They've got some really great products. Um, actually, we're going to talk about another one coming up a little bit later. But what Taya did is they went to Canada and they – took Teo Duo. Okay, so for my Canadian friends up there who've used Teo Duo, you know that this is a combination of Trelos and Hyaluron. And we know Hyaluron, um, most of us guys know Hyaluron because it's like from the lotion that we put on our faces, right? So we don't we dry out our skin, you know, and it kind of like tightens up the collagen, but it's more of a hydrating. I'm hydrating for the skin because we have a lot of skin showing here. Um, and then the Trelos, the Trelos is ridiculous. The Trelos is super cool. Um, and for those of you that are multitasking, you're GTSing stuff and doing other stuff, look up the Rose of Jericho. The Rose of Jericho is this dead weed that grows in the middle of Saudi Arabia. And whenever it rains, it just flourishes like this, just, um, it looks like dahlias and roses. Just, I don't know, I'm just naming plants because uh, my wife loves flowers. So I just remember names. Um, and I'm like, Frasia, like Frasia. Anyways, it blooms beautifully. Now, you may say to yourself, how does it bloom like that? And you may say to yourself, what is this sorcery here? And I will share with you, it is Trelos. Trelos is basically a saccharide. It's like a sugar. And when the cells go into stress, they basically coat themselves in Trelos and wait to be activated again. So it's almost like hibernating, for lack of a better way of thinking about it. Where do we see Trelos here, you know, in, in stuff we do? Well, any of you guys ever get those little Listerine tablet, those little gel things? Yeah, you put on your tongue and Mm -hmm. that's trailers sea monkeys you know i don't know if there's anybody out there who's you know uh, who's a little bit older who remembers sea monkeys um oh not rose in jericho rose of jericho that's cute uh, so um the uh 
sea monkeys were basically this little envelope. And in the 70s, I'm going to be honest with you people, okay? There was not a whole lot to do in the 70s. We did not have Atari. We had nothing. We had, we had kick the can, all right? <laughs> we had to talk to people. You had to literally get up and go to a phone that had a cord attached to it. And then your mom or dad would pick up and go, hi, Mark needs to go. <sighs> right? It's, you had People knew when you were home because they got a busy signal. Monsters. But we also had these things called sea monkeys where it was this little packet. It looked like um, like Hidden Valley Ranch dressing. And you poured it into water and they would kind of uh, absorb the water. And all of a sudden you just see these little organisms floating around, which was uh, so cool. This is so cool. Okay. Like Miley Cyrus has said, uh, that's cool. And what it was, was it was basically shrimp brine. Um, and the, the, the shrimp brine um, would come back to life. And there was, it was amazing. And also as another aside, if anybody ever ate a ponderosa or a sizzler and you had your all you can eat shrimp, then you took all the breading off, you would see it was probably one of those shrimp brine. It was just, there was barely any shrimp there. Um, yeah, but anyways, I digress. So trailose is phenomenal for, you know, coating uh, the epithelial tissue, um, stopping it from, from desiccating. So you have hyaluron and then you have trailose. Those two are Teo Duo. To get it approved here in the United States, they needed an inactive ingredient. So they added povidone. Povidone is another hydrating kind of thickening agent. Hence, you now have Ibisia. So thank you very much, my Canadian friends. But the question to them was, is that if we don't have Rota, which you might, because um, it's a Japanese product, um, is it per se, what about using Lodamax? Um, or using a steroid, which brings us to our current slide we're at. Yeah, I mean, an anti-inflammatory basically works on just reducing, it's more secondary to the pain aspect, okay? You know, the pain itself can oftentimes be activated because of the inflammation. So affecting the nerves, that neuropathy we just talked about, um, which feels like yesterday ago. Um, and literally by putting a patient on anti-inflammatory, you're quelling the sequelae of whatever it is that's happening to it. So I do agree with you. I think Lodamax SM uh, is, a, is a great drop, 0.38%. Um, you know, remember, it's the mechanism of delivery. It's how these drops get there. And Bausch Plus Lom has done a phenomenal way of, of getting that lodopradinol in there. And Veltus is going to be hard for you guys to find. Um, this was a Cala product. Um, and Alcon sold both in Veltus, uh, bought both in Beltus and um, I sue this from Cala. Um, and I don't think they're going to be marking in Beltus, so we'll just pretend that's not there. But uh, but then don't forget Flarex, too. I mean, Flarex is another great, this is FML, but this is fluoromethylene acetate. And the, the acetate suspension penetrates almost as deeply as Predforte um, in helping your patients um, without having, you know, some of the, the more uh, nefarious concerns that we all might have but the canadian you know you also have gel and you know to me this could and should be to you have a tremendous amount of, of, of inflammation a tremendous amount of pain on any patient um don't forget the ophthalmic ointment um you know back in the day we used to squirt a little ointment in patients eyes thinking that would help them with a corneal abrasion or erosion and i'm going to share with you no no, and in in, I think it was like 1997, Iki presented a paper which showed that bland ointment does not help in healing uh, erosions or abrasions. Um, it actually works against it. And I think part of the reason why is because it, I think it really gums the system up and there's a lot of a reduction in, in oxygen, which means more inflammation. So we do have this treatment for post-operative pain. Um, and, and I keep showing the indications, but we're doctors, okay? Go in there and doctor. You know, you want to use this that's not surgical? Boom, well, you can. As long as you can get a group of your peers to say, yeah, I would do that too. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's called standard of care. So Lodamax is great. You know, this study, they showed higher rates of pain-free, um, relatively much quicker than not using them at all. Okay. So when you start looking at some of the indications, you know, I, I, I always find it funny when you think of an indication for a viral disease, because how else are you going to absolutely know that it's, it's simplex or if it's a virus, you, you, you've got to be provocative people. Okay. Right. It's, it's like, you know, 
It's like that song from Fergie. It's provocative. It was a Black Eyed Peas, Fergie, whatever. And Blades of Glory, look it up, okay? And we did see some side effects associated with this. Here's a, another opportunity for us. And this is almost oral. So, Steph, I got you. Because it's going to be dissolved. It's going to go through the puncta. They're going to swallow it. Boom. Oral. Okay. And this is basically Dextenza. Um, ocular Therapeutics here in the United States um, has basically given us an opportunity to use an intracanicular dexamethasone ophthalmic insert. So it's indicated to treat inflammation and pain following surgery. But again, we're doctors, okay? So we can do this. And they show statistically significantly lower amounts of pain. Well, think about this. If you have a patient who you don't want to put drops in um, or who's, you know, complaining about um, discomfort, inflammation, but this, this to me is a, a really – opportune way for us to be able to provide and get medications into our, our patient's eyes um, as well as into um, uh, maybe even just, you know, a little bit systemically, just a little bit systemically, if you will. Um, I'm pretty confident that this is available in any one of your states that you're going to. Um, easy to do, um, you know, if you have challenges in doing that. I know there's like some labs you could probably go to and they can show you how to drop that in there. But you put a plug in, you can put you can put one of these intracanicular uh, devices in. You know, <clears throat> but you know what would really help our patients. And I just I, I think it's important, to, you know, before, as I told you, you know, we talk oral, but let's bring it back a little bit. Is that do exhaust everything you possibly can topically and so i i mean what do you think our patients are clamoring for like what what do you think like every one of them looks at you and says you know oh, what do you want right what do you think anybody yeah anybody and i'll tell you what they want okay they want me to stop trying to read these things here they want prepare game can i get a what what yeah exactly you know it Right? Have you ever had a patient when you put a drop in their eye and they're like, oh, they, oh my, oh, hey, thank you. And then you watch them looking at the bottle, like eyeing the bottle, like they're trying to do some Jedi trick to bring that bottle into their possession. Oh, you know it. You know they are. When I was practicing, I don't know, 20 years ago, I was uh, working in an office where this young lady came in. Um, she was a walk-in, massive pain. I mean, her eye was just red beyond blah. And um, she, they brought her to Lane. The technicians worked her up for me because um, you know I need most of my technicians to pretty much just tell me what I need to do. Just go in there, Mark. Um, and before I could go in to see this patient, um, I got a telephone call from an emergency room doctor at county in the county hospital. For people that have no insurance, a lot of them will just go to county. And he said, look, um, my staff overheard this patient saying that she was making an appointment to come see you. I just wanted to prepare you. I never got to see her, but she stole every bottle of preparacin we had in our exam rooms. So I go in there. Sure enough, Sassy Bridges is taking all the preparacin. Um, so, you know, and why is that? Because they know, because we know, okay? We know it works, okay? There's been studies, and um, shout out to my Canadian fans up there of, of the Woo, of the Woo pod here. Um, the Woo, we're going to figure out if we can do like something with Wu Tang, but it's not Wu Tang. We'll figure it out. Um, with the Woo Woo crew, Woo Woo crew. Yeah, my Canadian fans from the Woo Woo crew up there, thanks for being here. Um, not sure what province you're in. I'm going to go with, um, maybe Manitoba. What's up? And in this study, they basically took 0.05% or one tenth diluted prepare gain for corneal injuries. And they basically compared it against an arm that had artificial tears. Well, obviously, okay. These patients loved it. Oh, loved it. Right. But the bigger thing in this small little study was that there was no ocular complications and no delayed wound healing. Okay, there was another study about 10 years ago. They, this was, I think, in, um, in London, I think it was. They diluted a topical preparacane, noting that it was an efficacious analgesic for acute coronal injuries. No adverse responses happened. Um, 
And then there was another one, there was topical and uh, tetra, uh, excuse me, tetracaine that was used for 24 hours safe, highly effective by patients. So I, I am, I am, I am blessing you the opportunity for, if you have patients that just have an overt sense or discomfort in their eye, or maybe let's go back to those neuropathic patients, um, which is more of a challenge because honestly, a small amount of repair can is not going to help those patients. And maybe that's just another provocative way for us to know whether or not this is actually helping them or not. Um, but, you know, you have patients who are going to be out, you know, away from your office or you have a rural office. You know, I, I know we, we were all kind of, you know, trained and beaten down to, to never do this, but in small amounts, you know, and, and oftentimes too, to let's be honest, it's probably a placebo effect, right? I mean, what I'll do is I'll pop open a little bit of maybe, you know, some refresh and why refresh? Because Allergan still gives us samples. Thank you, Allergan. Okay. But more importantly is because you can get the little green nipple off the top there. And that's, that's mainly the reason why. Um, you know, that's a 0.3 milliliter. And I usually will go about five drops. You know, if I'm feeling extra special, maybe, you know, seven or eight drops. Shake it, blow on it, give it to the patient. Um, and let them know, look, you know what? I'm going to see you back in X number of days. Um, I only want you to use this for the first few days if you need to use it more because you know they're going to use it. You know they are. And so who knows how much it's actually helping. We have other types of shields, contact lenses, um, other things that can, can help our patients um, as well. But something else that also is systemic in nature, um, thank you for asking, which becomes oral, if you will, because it's going to drain down the back of their throat. I'm bringing it back to oral again because I know this is an oral weekend. Um, is amniotic membranes. I do not think that collectively as a profession, we use enough amniotic, we, we don't, we don't. Um, you know, I, I still feel we're all kind of back in the, the day of, of, you know, what the least cost-effective or the minimally um, labor-intensive way of helping patients is always the best. And I'm gonna say, yet, Oh, wait, is that too soon? We're not speaking Russian. I'm going to say no. Um, finding ways that are going to, you know, change the course of action is going to be the best. And so we have these, these great tools, if you will, in, in, in our uh, um, armamentarium. I love that word. Okay. This is the most innermost line of the placenta. And I, I had a patient. She's 83 years old. God bless her. Okay, the woman is covered in cat hair, right? She comes in and it's like she has nobody to talk to, right? Um, so when you know those patients, right? When they come in, all they want to do is talk, right? And you're like, okay, got to go away. One more question, right? And she comes in with her son um, um, who has special needs and his caretakers. So all four of us are in this tiny little room. And I'm just like trying not to have an asthma attack because I really feel like she's building herself a suit of cat hair, um, kind of like um, Buffalo Bill did in Silence of the Lambs, right? How he was, you guys know, if you, and I'm, honestly, it's Sunday this afternoon, there's nothing going on. Okay, go watch Silence of the Lambs again. You'll love it. And, and anyways, my point being is I said to her, I go, look, I go, I'd like to put uh, a, an amniotic membrane in your eye. It's a tiny list. She goes, oh, she goes, is that like a stem cell? producing type tissue. And I go, well, as a matter of fact, actually it does. It does kind of um, share the same kind of uh, stem cell features. And she goes, oh, she goes, that's fantastic. Yes, I think that's a great idea. I was blown away. I mean, my point in saying that is, is that I sometimes think that we don't realize that our patients are maybe a little bit more attuned to some of the newer technologies that we have. And even though we think they were putting something in there out there, they might be thinking, why have we not done this to me sooner? Okay. Um, you know, there was a, a study where they looked at corneal nerve regeneration after using a self-retained cryopreserved amniotic membrane. Um, they're, they're really, I mean, let's, let's beat around the bush here. There really is only one uh, cryopreserved and that's from BioTissue, whose um, template I stole in that picture you saw there. Um, the Procara. I mean, and so they compared 
their conventional dry eye treatment to a cryopreserved amniotic membrane, and obviously the improvement in tear breakup time was significant. These patients had um, a reduction in speed. Um, all the things that we see there, they, they did much better when we treated them with this amniotic membrane. Um, the, the cryotech method basically is the only method that retains uh, the structure, if you will. You know, what Procara has demonstrated is that it keeps this extracellular matrix with these heavy chain hyaluronic acids um, well within this cryopreserved tissue. Now, the challenge obviously is that it comes in that, that ring. Um, and, you know, you may, you may notice that I'm talking to you a lot about using these a little bit more proactively or using these more maybe on the early signs of those NK patients or early you know signs of pain and discomfort and if you put a ring in there that's you know pretty much expanding their eye right uh, they look like you know uh, Burgess Meredith from Rocky uh, um, then patients may not be happy I, I've kind of reserved my Procara for those central um, ulcers those central issues those 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 ones where honestly the pain from the ring will be less than the pain they're getting from everything else. Um, you know, and here's, you know, some significant abrasions. Here's the ring. Here it is on a patient that was inserted. This, this actually, I love showing this picture because it was the very first patient we ever put a Procare in. I think it was about 2016, 2017. And I had to ask my colleague, um, Dr. Christy Rhodes, um, to come in because she does – She's, she's, and you know, I, I, I know today that we're, we're honoring the memory of uh, Dr. Epstein um, and art, you know, you, you think of art in two ways. You think of him as contacts, you know, fusarium and just all the contact, you know, the technology and advancements he did um, and dry eye. And it's kind of a marriage here of this, if you will. Um, Christy does the specialty fits and just, you know, she's, she's, she's way smarter than I could ever be. And so I had to bring her in. Um, I'm like, Christy, check this out. It's like a scleral, it's like a scleral contact. She goes, no, it's not. I go, it's close. She goes, Mark, it's not even close. Um, okay, whatevs. And so she came in and inserted this. Never even, she'd never even seen one. Never, the rep was standing in the back there. Um, yeah, so my point being is that that's this picture. It's a reminder. But you see the ring, how it's away from the uh, limbus. That's, that's the fit you want. If this bad boy starts hitting the limbus, these patients are a lot more discomfort. We do have other dry forms, and I am going to highlight this dry form, which is essentially the SLFX. Um, and I'm highlighting this basically because um, this is a dry form. And we say dry because it's just not, you know, wet. Um, but so it's, it's not moist. Uh, it's dry. It's dry. But what they've done is they've stripped away the kind of epithelial tissue, the outer layer, if you will, of this membrane. So you're really just focusing in on the good stuff, if you will. Okay. The nutrient rich collagens and, and uh, uh, proteoglycans that we need here. Again, I told you this was going to be another product from Taya. This is from Taya. This is a cell effects. And you can get a three, a five, and eight millimeter. You don't need eight millimeters. Okay, a three or a five is fine because if you look at this little membrane, you can stick, you could take a contact lens and you take like a Wexel sponge. If you don't have any Wexels in your practice, get some. Um, and you're going to clean, dry off the contact lens. You take this with forceps, you place it right in the center there and you put it on the eye. Here's the kicker to that though, is that they don't need to, well, what? Woo woo. Look at this. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't need to basically even put this on the eye or in the contact. Um, if anybody ever wonder what Stephanie looks like, there's Stephanie. Um, is you literally can just fold it up and put it in the fornix um, to these patients for any types of discomfort. So I'm using a lot more of these in so my 83 year old patient who I said, look, I go, I, I want to put a contact on your eye to help you. Um, we're going to put the membrane in there. And she said, oh, you know, the, the stem cell technology. I'm like, yes. And she goes, oh, let's do it. Let's get this done. Um, these things can be stored for five years. Um, and, you know, there's a, another product that, that was developed by a, a group of our colleagues um, uh, named Sleep Right, Sleep Tight. Sleep right, sleep tight. I just, I, they need a jingle. Sleep it right, sleep it tight. And essentially, it's these adhesive bandages 
that you put on your eye when you're sleeping. And this is for kind of like a, uh, for lag ophthalmos or basically for that nocturnal lid apposition issues that patients get. But if you bought a pack of those for your practice, they're like, I think, I don't know, 30 bucks for a hundred. Um, if they're not, just say that's how much I quoted you and that's how much you want them for. And literally what you can do is give a couple to your patient. You can put that, um, the dry, the cell effects in there and then basically patch their eye with the um, sleep tight, sleep right. I and mean, I think it's sleep tight, T-I-T-E, sleep right, I think it is. Um, but I, we, I bring this up mainly because there are other dry forms of amniotic membranes that don't basically, that aren't acellular, that don't strip off that tissue. Um, and those patients, you oftentimes see more inflammation. You know, here, here's some other studies talking about like neuropathic corneal pain as we go back here. You know, it provides a safe and effective treatment approach to sustained pain control in patients. So, you know, maybe for, you know, start off, um, you know, with a Procura or maybe kind of bring it down to a dry form. And, and you know, maybe it wears off after three or four months and you bring them back. You know, here's, here's an example of a patient that I had um, that basically had a little NK. Um, and when we talk about NK, there's only one drug that's been approved for neurotrophic keratitis to help these patients open up those pathways um, and also to kind of help them with their discomfort. And it activates, it's a recombinant neural growth factor that we talked about. Um, Oxervate is from Dompe. Again, there's, you know, a, a very small group of, of patients might need this, but I think we wait till, um, till they're in significant amount of discomfort before we get it. And before anybody throws up a question and says, dude, isn't this like $80,000 or don't they have to like cut out one of their livers or spines? I'm like, no, they don't. Okay. Um, they have a lot of opportunities from Dompe to get um, uh, sponsored or to get grants. Um, I have never had a patient who was not able to get this. It took, it took time. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It took time. And in between, I was doing amniotic membranes. And, and if I can digress for a second, too, for those of you in the States, you know, if you're treating Medicare patients, Medicare will reimburse you very, very, very handsomely for inserting the membrane. They won't reimburse you for, for the product itself. But the amount that they're going to reimburse you to put it in exceeds how much it ever would cost you to buy one. Um, and more importantly, it exceeds um, how much you would be generating revenue on just man, you know manage them other ways. Um, so from a practice management standpoint, but also basically from a patient management standpoint, you know uh, this is really important. You know, and so we're going to skip that a little bit. So let's get into a little bit of some orals. Um, you know, I know that. Um, Wu had hyped up the whole oral thing and, you know, that's okay. I mean, you know, one of the really beautiful things about um, doing lectures and things, and I noticed that she said that she has the handouts there and I, I changed things up a little bit on the handouts, but your original handouts had a lot more oral stuff known in there is that, you know, you can, you can call something you want and then just start talking about it. And so, and what I do is I just watch the participant numbers and if they start dropping really low, then I'll change what I'm talking about. And so, Thank you guys for staying on there. It's uh, it's really it's a tribute. I appreciate you. Thanks. Oral analgesics. What is the three main categories? Well, obviously we have over the counter. Um, we have non narcotic prescriptions, and then we have narcotic prescriptions. And we start thinking about OTC because you know me, I'm down with some OTC. Okay. Don't you wish there was like music in the background? Can you get some OTC? You know me, I'm down with OTC. Um, but you know, we started thinking about acetosilic acid, a okay, bear, as we got our little picture there. Um, you know, obviously, um, took the picture out, put the picture back in. Um, for those of you who get COPE approval, you know what I'm talking about. Here is a, um, it, there's generic, there's bear, there's Excedrin. Um, when we started thinking about aspirin, you know, the challenge that you have to have with aspirin is um, worrying about what the long-term complications are going to be by patients that use too much of it. You know, aspirin is not great for pain, okay? Aspirin is much better for inflammation, right? So I know we all like to kind of reach for aspirin. You know, it, it's good from a, uh, a um, um, 
anti um, clotting. So, you know, especially the vid, for those of you that um, had COVID, you know that oftentimes, you know, a lot of information we were trying to figure out, one of them was to basically stay on baby aspirin because there was some patients that were having, you know, uh, issues related to, to heart disease following COVID. And so it was really more a matter of just kind of keeping that blood flowing, you know, stay on the baby aspirin. The challenge with, with aspirin um, is that, you know, uh, kids under 18, um, you know, they can develop raised disease. Um, using too much of it. Parents, they get super crazy. You know, that the whole Munchausen syndrome um, patients, which brings up another great movie, Sixth Sense. If you have not seen The Sixth Sense, right, then you need to, um, right? And just in that movie, just look for red. Just when you see red, you'll know what I'm talking about, okay? I mean, we get some bleeding disorders, patients that drink a lot. And it's interesting, it's, you know, we don't think about the flora, inside the stomach uh, and other issues or just how much um you know alcohol and other other long-term damage can cause to our patients but it can and it does um and so you worry about patients that are, are more aligned with heavy drinking you kind of want to avoid this you know obviously if somebody says they're allergic to allergies then or you know aspirin um i think acetaminophen is is a much better pain reliever than aspirin so if you're, if you're reaching for something to talk to your patients about, then something like, you know, a Tylenol, okay? The ASA, if you shall, um, is only going to help with the inflammation, but our APAP um, will definitely help a little bit more with the pain. 325 milligrams, you can get that 500 milligram extra strength. Now, I'm going to be a thousand percent honest with you. You know, in, in our LASIK uh, surgeries that we do, um, I have never ascribed to providing pain to patients, pain medication. And for those of you who have uh, taken call or been around patients, it's, I don't know, there's just a general sense for me, at least, and just for me, a general sense of, um, I don't care. Yeah, it's, it's a general, it's not, it's not a lack of empathy. It's more a sign of, look, it's gonna hurt. Okay, I don't need you to call me at two in the morning to let me know it's hurting. Okay, and so I'm going to answer the phone exactly like you think I would. <sighs> Hello? Yeah. And there's been so many times where I've talked to patients I call and my wife is like, Mark, you're being a jerk. And I'm like, you're a jerk. It's, that doesn't end well either. And then I'm like, calm down. That, that doesn't help either. Um, and today's her birthday, by the way. Today's my wife's birthday. So I'm going to tell all of you guys that you said happy birthday to her. Um, <clears throat> and this is my gift to her that I'm spending two hours with you guys. So when patients call, it's like I remind them that we told them it was going to hurt. There will shall be some <laughs> discomfort. And so that verbal value we talked about, which is letting patients know that, you know, if you were to provide them a oral and, and uh, um, pain medication, okay, those don't necessarily get to the cornea. They're, they're not really going to do any significant change to what's going on in the cornea, uh, especially from the fact that there's no, you know, uh, um, blood vessels coursing through there to really kind of get it to there. It's going to be more peripheral discomfort, peripheral pain relief, and a lot of it doesn't get to the cornea, so the verbal volume. But one thing that I do think helps is putting them on some, some extra strength Tylenol, okay? You know, maybe even having them use, you know, nighttime, uh, maybe put a little Benadryl in there, knock them out, okay? I know Benadryl is mother's little helper, but for you know, cranky little 40 year old, you know, uh, patients, you know, give them some Benadryl and tell them to go night night because honestly, that's, that's the best they can do. What's nice also about um, acetaminophen is that it's okay with pregnancy. You know, there's a new, as, as you guys probably already read, you know, 3000 milligrams is kind of your, your new high, if you will. Again, some of the contraindications are liver disease, you know, alcoholism, if they have that, any hypersensitivity. And I, and I use the word hypersensitivity because that's exactly what it is. It's hypersensitivity. Um, and so that's, that's kind of cool there, all right? Good. You know, um, some non-steroidal anti-inflammatories we can see. 
um, you know, if I can also digress for a second, if we go back and think about uh, um, uh, acetaminophen, there, there was a study that actually was done. Um, and no, I lied. It was Advil. Never mind. It was Advil. Um, so we'd have to go back to aspirin, but I don't want to. But there was a study that they did where they actually showed that patients that have like um, um, kind of low-grade inflammation, like iritises. So you have those patients that get recurrent iritises, or maybe those patients that have uh, Posner-Schlossman syndrome. And Posner-Schlossman, for those of you who don't know or don't you know forgot or just, just want to hear me talk more, is literally when you have a low-grade inflammation associated with um, high pressure, which is kind of almost kind of counterproductive to what you think. You think you'd have um, a little iritis. You tend to kind of have a little bit lower pressure. Um, and the pressure doesn't necessarily spike. Here, you have a higher pressure with uh, low-grade inflammation, which also I will share with you is the number one sign that you should be looking for when you see patients that have herpes zoster. Um, patients that we you know, we always hear about patients with zoster and which may go to, you know, systemically having patients, you know what, let's, let's, let's work this through here, people. See, this is how standard of care works is that if, there's been studies that have shown that using Advil, okay, or using, um, you know, medications on our patients here, um, systemic medications can help to reduce the amount of inflammation. Um, and we can do that to kind of almost like prevent it, if you will, being proactive. Instead of putting them on a steroid, they could actually be on you know, 3,000 milligrams of Advil. Then I told you that the number one sign in zoster is an iritis. When you have a patient who comes in who has um, iritis, or excuse me, has zoster, and you get those primary care doctors Oh, I've got a patient sitting in front of me. I think they have zoster. Can you see them? And you're like, you know, the, the likelihood of there being, you know, ocular involvement is extremely remote. But the thing you should be looking for is iritis. About 47, 50% of patients, that is the only sign they have. And, I, and, and I'm guilty of it because, you know, I blame the patient who's added on to my schedule because their doctor thought they needed to be there. And I'm like, eh. And you look for the lesions or the pseudo lesions, or pseudo dendrites, look for an iritis. But here's the other thing too. If that patient then in turn starts getting, you know, where you, you treat the iritis, you put them on a steroid and then their pressure starts elevating. To me, I, I, I believe that that's like a, a, a posner Schlossman's. So it's almost like it's a, a provocative kind of like, you know, the song I told you about. Um, that you can only skate to one song, one song only, Blades of Glory, check it out, is that what you're doing is, is you're basically looking at patients, starting them on an anti-inflammatory who has zoster patients, their pressure is increasing, they now are developing glaucoma, which in turn to me implies that if you didn't put them on this area, you wouldn't have known that they were going to develop glaucoma, hence you're saving their vision, you save their lives. In a very roundabout way, what I'm suggesting is, is that if you have patients that have zoster, um, is to put them on Advil. Um, it, even if you see nothing else, okay, um, is, is to put them on Advil, okay? We have some over-the-counter NSAIDs that patients can go get these little bad boys. Um, um, oh, I keep talking about Advil, and here we are, back to Advil. Um, is you, you put these patients on um, 200, 400, 600 milligrams. I, I would say about 3,000 milligrams, okay? Um, Naproxen is another one. Aleve. Be careful with the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or the over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatories because these patients tend to get um, some gastric distress. I, I tend to see a lot more um, using um, uh, the NSAIDs than I do with either of the aspirin or the... Uh, um, uh, uh, Tyler, Tylenols. So what about et cetera? Okay, various amounts of, of, of aspirin um, or the APAP inside there. These are great for tension, migraine. They come in extra strength. And that little bit of caffeine helps with patients with headaches. So if you have somebody who comes in 
<clears throat> excuse me, um, with the, with with a very mild migraine, or you know, they came in because they have some sinus issues, or just some head head discomfort. You know, don't don't think that everything has to be you know stronger or greater than it needs to be. You know, like an Excedrin, you know, with a tension headache, uh, it has that little uh, amount of caffeine in there, um, works really well for these patients too. The prescription non steroidal anti inflammatories are, are probably not something that I would see any of us really prescribing. Um, you know, 500 milligrams tends to be the initial dose. Um, you have Nalfon, Daypro. Um, a lot of these are, are, are mainly um, from the perspective of using them for anti inflammatory especially in and around rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you have Indesen, which is for non-general pain indication. Um, it's Ketorolog, um, you know, or, or Lodine, you can see. Uh, we can use those as well. But again, not something that I see us in our practices doing that we really need to do. Um, I don't see anybody out there reaching for a prescription pack for some Voltaren because you could go to the over-the-counter non-steroidals. And if those aren't helping um, enough, and mainly, like I said, it's, it's a lot more to do with the inflammation um, than it is anything else. Um, you know, uh, I would go with the Excedrin before I would go with any of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, especially when we start thinking about all the different uh, challenges that we have with non steroidal and inflammatories. And there's tons of different ones, you know, and, but mainly again, I would tell you they're either for arthritis. And, you know, the, the biggest concern here again is that GI disease, the, the distress that our patients get, the hypersensitivity, some of the other side effects they might get with these. Uh, again, we talk about that. A, a lot of the times patients will get, you know, challenges, especially if a lot of their, uh, as I mentioned before, their flora, within their digestive system is not working well. It's why, you know, we worry about, you know, yeast infections um, when we put patients on low dose antibiotics is because we need sometimes that good flora. <laughs> and uh, especially if you're an alcoholic, um, then you don't have those things or if the composition of, of um, the, the other disease states might, might challenge it for patients. But what are some other uses for oral non anti-inflammatories? Well, you know, we talked about uveitis a little while ago. Um, so here for us in, 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 in optometry, in our, our practice mode, if you shall, you know, using them for inflammatory, we talk about these rebounding patients. So if you have somebody who's coming in just constantly um, with a significant amount of uveitis and you don't want to keep them on, on, uh, on Advil, um, <clears throat> you know, you know, then I would refer them to their primary care doctor um, or consult with their primary care doctor. But it, it is a good way of just kind of managing that in these patients. Cystoid macular edema, I mean, obviously topical is better. Um, but if you have somebody who just has really uh, persistent, you know, maybe it be uh, diabetic macular edema or cystoid macular edema, um, then I don't think it hurts to, to challenge your patients with, you know, a non steroidal anti-inflammatory. And then, of course, you know, an episcleritis or scleritis. And again, I, I always defer to the patients, you know, um, to, to their perception of the problem. And I, because I, I feel, you know what, I, I'm going to kind of, you know, proselyze a little bit here, is that I feel like we, collective as a profession, almost have to, get patients to buy into what we're stepping in, to smell what we're stepping in more so than our MD or our DO counterparts. And I, I, I say that um, partially because I think, you know, I feel that sometimes we, we're our own enemy sometimes because we ask patients if it's okay. And, and I know, you know, psychologically, we don't just go and say, oh, um, I'm going to do this, okay? But we do it sometimes with our body language or we do it with, you know, sometimes with, with uh, some verbal cues that don't really we realize it. It's like, you know, like what we can do, you know, is almost kind of like saying, um, you know, I'm thinking we could do it, but I might not do it. We say things like I recommend, right? I don't, don't recommend. I mean, recommending is like me going to Ponderosa 
or a sizzler and saying, hey, what do you think about these all you can eat shrimp? And they're like, oh, I totally recommend you get those. And then I realize I hate shrimp. I mean, I, I don't need your recommendation. I was, uh, not about that. I mean, it, to me, what we need to do is basically this is what we need to do. And so part of that gauging that I was just talking about is that if I have a patient who's just like writhing in pain, and I say to them, you know, the verbal volume we talked about, I say, oh, you know, I could put you on this. I also, in my mind, I may think, okay, what can I do to really help this patient? It kind of goes back to that 24-hour treatment thing. So if you see a patient with, you know, episcleritis or a scleritis, or you see those patients, we see a lot of our patients that come in now that have like a horiolum, okay? And if you're using the word sty still, Please stop. Just, just stop. Okay, stop. There's no such thing as sty. Okay, and, and I always challenge every person I can see. If you can find the ICD-10 code for a sty, then I'll stop saying this. But there is no saying it's a ordeal or shalazin. So, if you see a patient, we see those patients now. The question is, do we start them on an oral antibiotic? Do we put them on something if if it's really red and uncomfortable? And the question should be also is why would we not put them on like an oral NSAID um, to kind of help control that? So, so you know, scleritis, episcleritis, just, you know, note it, put it in there, okay? I mentioned, you know, about five minutes ago, I didn't realize I had these slides in here, um, but basically this was a substitute for steroids for adjunct therapy. I mentioned that, you know, it was basically about 3,000 milligrams a day in certain conditions like a recurrent iritis is, and especially like if you think about some of those other um, uh, low-grade anti-inflammatory uh, challenges that we see with, with some of our patients, okay? When we start thinking oral narcotic agents, you know, the different schedules, right? So schedule one, abuse, high potential, okay? Only available investigational use. Sorry, my friends, okay? You know, examples of those are kind of like the heroin, Okay, the, the, the LSD, right? I'm not even sure. I, I hope, I don't even know MJ, Michael Jackson. I don't even know what I wrote there, but let's put it this way. If we can't do it, so just don't do it. Okay, you can't do it, okay? I mean, I don't think it's Mary Jane. You know, I'm trying to remember, because honestly, when I get to this part of the slides, I'm just like, what does it matter? We can't do it. We can, so don't even bother. But schedule two these are written prescription only with no refills, you know, vitamins, hydrocodone. Um, it's all what is the abuse power, right? Right. And do you guys remember the movie um, Stripes um, with Bill Murray? Like at the very beginning when he's driving and he's like all crazy and this woman goes, what are you doing? He says, I'm sorry. It was all that uh, um, cough syrup that I drank this morning. Yeah, codeine. Wow. Okay. And schedule threes are the ones that, you know, we collectively have the ability and opportunity to prescribe for. These are modally abusive, okay? And, you know, when we talk about, you know, to me, anything that you could do to further or long-term hurt a patient, you have to step back and ask yourself, is this the medication that I want to be using at this moment? And again, I'm going to be honest with you. When we got our ability to write oral medications in Zona here, um, I was all like, you know, are you in pain? Because daddy's got some candy. I can write some for you, right? And then, you know, and this was, this was you know, before the whole, you know, oxy um, challenges that we had and problems that we had. This is before, you know, that, that, that company that we shall rename silent about, you know, I mean, uh, Purdue. I mean, so it just, you know, we, we just won't talk about these things. I mean, I, I was freely giving to them. And I realized in a very short amount of time that when I didn't have these medications available to my patients, they didn't suffer. Maybe, you know, their pain lasts a little longer uh, for a day or so, but they, nobody suffered. So don't feel you have to do these, okay? Um, you know, basically... Um, you know, Tylenol, Tylenol, codeine, these are your schedule threes. Your schedule fours are basically the ones that are just moderately abusive. Um, and then obviously schedule five, very low abuse. And that's where you're just going out there and just chugging some over the counter Robitussin because that's how you roll. Okay. That's how you roll. Okay. That's how you do it. 
Okay. Each state law is a little different. So you kind of got to go look at your different state laws to see where you're at. Um, you know, it's always interesting me, you know, my heart goes out to my peeps out in Cali. If any of my Cali doctors there, um, look, Gavin did us dirty. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, California had a bill which passed their Senate and uh, their Congress and was on the desk, ready to be signed by Gavin Newsom, um, which would allow them to have some some laser capabilities and, and some other really pretty significant expansions. And um, <clears throat> somebody got to Gavin. Somebody got to him. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he, yeah, kind of sad. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. California's got some good stuff going on there. And there's some more state laws as we go through here. Mm -hmm. Too many state laws. Okay, you know, one thing that obviously when we think about these medications is that the gold standard for, for oral pain medications is morphine. This is this is the reference. And I don't know how many of you, uh, there was a TV show that was on Showtime, um, The Nick. Um, and it just, it, I thought it was great, okay? Um, and, um, for those of you who think I just watch too much TV and stuff, no, I don't. Okay. But I will share with you though, that is my favorite thing to do with patients as ask them what they're watching. Cause then it gauges to me how much screen time they're getting, but also I get some good ideas for new shows. So, you know, and tonight's Sunday. So what are we talking tonight? Yeah. House of Dragon. Da, 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 da. Um, and anywho is that the Nick was all about this hospital in, in New York back in the 1800s. And it's just bizarre to me to watch and see some of the stuff that, that they did. I mean, just how, I mean, you know, morphine addicts, right? I mean, do you, do you want anybody who's on morphine, you ever even, you know, thought about morphine, but this was, you know, their, their standard drug when you talk about, you know, using and administering these for potential uh, medications. Um, we start thinking about codeine. I mean, this is useful for mild to moderate pain, fairly sedating. Um, but again, the GI, you know, things that we talk about, especially with these systemic medications, <clears throat> it works well, especially like when you, you put it with Tylenol um, or aspirin, if you will. Um, and it has that kind of anti-inflammatory action. This is a class two, which basically means that it's mild or low physical dependence, possibility of high physiological dependence on these. Hydrocodone, six times more potent than codeine. So, you know, here we are thinking, oh, I'm going to give my patient a little, you know, Tylenol with some, some codeine, and then you get hydrocodone. And this just kind of goes back to the whole, you know, uh, just sad abuse of nature of this medication. And, and I, I guess, you know, part of the reason why I think we collectively as a profession and me, me as well is holding back on doing anything orally, uh, especially with patients that's not either OTC or not steroidal, anything that has a, a classification system to it is because of the, the abuse that we saw. And, you know, it wasn't so much us as optometrists that contributed to it. We were very, very, very low um, uh, prescribers. Um, but you saw those family care doctors. I mean, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the show. Um, Michael Keaton won an Academy Award in um, just, you know, kind of just talking about the abuse that was going on there. So, you know, we had to worry about this, you know. When you look at this response to abuse of painkillers, the LA Times basically 3,733 prescription drug fatalities from 2006 to 2011, and 945 deaths were related to hydrocodone. Um, you know, <clears throat> and it was more the mid level practitioners, and as I was just saying, not so much as more as the primary care doctors and maybe the dentists. Um, you know, and, and I know that, you know, patients want that that discomfort taken away they want that pain to feel better you know some of the trade names norco lortab but it was the most prescribed medication in 2000 i mean think about that in 2011 it was the most prescribed more than an antibiotic more than hypertensive medications more than lipitor i mean lipitor i mean how many of us miss xanthalasma all those yeah uh, please you know, we talk about oxy, similar in potency to morphine, 10 to 12 times more potent than codeine. Um, it gives our patients that, that euphoria. And I think this is, 
why we saw the abuse that we did, um, uh, especially in those patients. Um, so, you know, just tough, you know, Tylenol plus ibuprofen, you know, made it more cost effective, fewer side effects. Um, but you know, it's all about a set of set of satisfaction. Okay. Some of the side effects that we see associated with these narcotic agents, abuse. Yes. Um, you know, the liver toxicity that we, we, we've talked about before with any of these medications that, you know, they got to run themselves through the liver, nausea, vomiting, constipation is a big one too. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, we think we're helping a patient and it's like, you know what, screw you Blumenstein because, um, I'm going to prescribe these baby. Um, I've got patients who are in pain. I want them to get the relief and then they're calling up and they're basically saying they're constipated. And so now what are you going to do? I oftentimes wanted to do a webinar where I just sat like that for about 20 seconds and made everybody think that it was frozen. Um, but since I've already screwed this thing up with my, my talking there, I can't. So let's bring it back full circle, my friends. Okay. Um, start simple. Okay. We're talking about managing pain in our practices. I mean, and I think you got to start from, the, from, from the easiest. It's, it's, uh, Occam's razor, okay, is you got to get in there and basically say, what's the simplest solution to this? Um, topicals are going to be your simplest. Maybe then go with your over-the-counter, okay, whether it be, you know, like a, a, a non steroidal anti-inflammatory, whether it be ibuprofen or whether it be, you know, a, um, aspirin, anything, okay? You know, the prescriptions are the things you want to hold off on um, for the more significant pain. Um, you know, and then on top of that, um, reserving those narcotics for when it's absolutely, absolutely necessary, you know, analgesics on a 24 hour basis, you know, if you're going to do something like that, like a Tylenol three, you know, I would not give my patients more than as much as I think they're going to use in 24 to 48 hours. So if I have a patient who I say, I want you to take, you know, one tablet or two tablets every four to six hours, I'm only going to give them enough that they're going to be able to take it for two days, you know? So they get 12 tablets, which would be basically six, which would be every three, four hours. Okay. It's enough. It's all you need. Okay. You got to make sure when you write your prescriptions, you have all your DEA information, everything on there, they're not going to get through. You know, when you think about mild pain, moderate pain, you can break it down. But, but I would tell you, if you're dealing with that real severe pain and you're thinking about going to something like a Vicodin um, is, to maybe get their primary care doctor involved as well. Or to ask yourself, really, what is the root or the origin of this pain? Or better, am I dealing with something neuropathic? Am I dealing with something that's that's a little bit greater and, and more uh, systemic than, than just topical? All right, okay. So make sure you're only prescribing for the eye-related pain. Um, you know, when we review your states as we go through there. you know. I will say, don't be afraid to use opiates if you needed to. Um, but at the same time, I'm also going to say, just think about all the other side effects associated with this. So I just want to run through a few cases. I know we have a few minutes because um, Stephanie stole some of my time um, with all the stuff at the beginning and she can't get it back. Woo woo. So I show you a case of a patient who basically is arriving in pain. Okay. Um, you know, if you think you know this one, then let me know. You see that there is some fluorescein stain, excuse me, some lysamine stain in there. Yeah. You also notice something too, her pupils dilated. Okay. Her pupil was not dilated by moi. Her pupil was dilated when she came in this way. Now I'm going to share with you, just give you just a little information. Okay. Is that this is a patient who actually is a, a staff member of ours. So we, we've seen her quite a lot. Um, and this sudden dilated pupil was relevant only from the perspective of that um, she was getting migraines. And we, we sent her out for MRIs. Uh, the surgeon I work with, like, sent her immediately, you know, get a, you know, an MRI and just, and my colleague, the um, brilliant Dr. Christy Rhodes, who was following her, was like, I just, I just don't, I think this is her migraines. I just think she's just, she has some neural reaction with migraines, but now she's like complaining that her eye is bothering her. Now, granted, 
this, you know, the fact that she's dilated, she can't see up close, it affected, it made her myopic. It was just all kinds of stuff going on. Anyways, long and the short of it is, um, we could not find a good reason why she had a lot of pain. And she kept saying, Dr. Dr. B, I just feel like there's something in my eye. I feel like there's nothing in your eye. Okay. She comes back to me about five minutes later and she goes, yeah, there is. Okay. Now she's an eye rubber. Okay. Crazy eye rubber. And do you also notice something? Okay. Do you see she has a bandaged contact lens in her eye? Okay. Because the original treatment for this was I put her in a bandaged contact lens because I thought that she was basically getting like recurrent erosions or something was going on um, because she's an eye rubber. So she's dead. anyway, as long as short of it is. Does anybody think they know what those are? Yes. Who said that? You're exactly right. Don't you wish you guys weren't all unmuted? Don't you wish everybody was unmuted right now and we'd all just be talking? And for those of you that are like shopping at the Costco or you're getting poutine over at Burger King, you're like, no, no, I don't want to be unmuted. You know the, the soap that comes with those little plastic beads, those little surf, little kind of like surfactant beads to help like, you know, kind of exfoliate? Our friend here had a loofah that she would throw in the washing machine. These things got out of the washing machine and somehow either got on her clothes or got on something. And yeah, the, exactly, Matthew Brown. Yes, beads from soap. See, I knew you were out there, my friend. Thanks, Matt, okay? Um, yeah, ridiculous. And they kept coming. They kept coming, oh my God. So this was somebody where it's like, you know, you talk about pain. It's like, you know, it's, it's almost kind of like just, yeah, I don't know. just want to share that case with you because it was cray cray, just cray cray across the board here. Okay. Here's a wicked abrasion. You can see that that is, yeah, this is, this is an older picture, but it just, I love the fact that you just see the tissues just rippled away there. Um, this is obviously somebody, you know, you can see the, the iris also um, is, is peaked. And we call that a peaked iris, and you kind of want to note it's right around 3.30, 4 o'clock. Sometimes post-operative cataract patients, if you see a peaked iris, it means that there's a um, vit the vitreous to the wound is pulling on it, and that might cause more inflammation, cause more discomfort. This is definitely somebody that I would want to try to control the pain with. Definitely want to do an, um, to breathe the cornea. Maybe put an amniotic membrane on this is somebody who would absolutely put on um, some Advil as well. We talked about, you know, refractive surgery, the microkeratome involved here. You see how much of the nerve damage or how much tissue has been removed. This is obvious. I can't show you an interlace, so I'm going old school, showing you a little microkeratome. Um, yeah, for those of you who didn't realize we used a blade and this thing would come across and just slice off some cheese bring it back. And if your staff wasn't, you know, they didn't put the rings in there. I'm pointing at it here. If they didn't put these clips in here well enough, then this would get loose. This would pop off and their flap would go flying. Good times. Good times. Okay. Got some hypopion, got a little, you know, central ulcer going on here. Infiltrated that almost looks fluffy. Um, you almost just wonder if we're dealing with something, you know, uh, fungal involved here, but you know their pain is going to be outrageous. So this is somebody definitely, absolutely going to be dilating the pupil. You're going to be starting them definitely on some some anti-inflammatory medications um, as well as covering that antibiotic. This is this right here. This is a perfect um, uh, Procara cryopreserved amniotic membrane patient. You remember, you can still put the medications and things on top of the eye, but that's a good one. Okay, we talked about it. Uh, uh, traumatic hyphema. This looks traumatic, you know, right? Um, you know, I didn't ask him how this happened. Um, I probably should have, but you know, more importantly, you see the hyphema. Um, you got to dial the pupil, keep the head up there. Um, I don't know that I would put them on a systemic medication because as the pressure goes down, um, watch the pressure, especially in these, watch the pressure. We already mentioned before, right, about the herb. You know, perfect, you know, beautiful picture of a patient coming in with that right down the midline. He's got the herp. He's in pain. He's got that, that you know, kind of tingling discomfort from the neuropathy. Um, but look in his eye. 
And this is somebody, again, I would tell you, start them on some Advil. Start them on that from the perspective of going on there. As well as we talked about before with an episcleritis and a scleritis. These are, these are patients that are going to be in pain because of the inflammation. So reducing the source, the inflammation. Um, I, I'll, I'll be sincere with you too. I, I probably would, you know, put this patient on um, uh, obviously a steroid, but I would dilate their pupil, um, especially the one in the lower right-hand corner. Um, to kind of help with that as well. Cold compress, you know, don't forget, I mean, taking an artificial tear, putting it in the refrigerator, making it cold, acts like a cool compress. Um, and it, it really has a really significant beneficial effect. And if not anything, um, don't forget, it's also, um, it could be that placebo effect. For body removal, these guys always should be dilated. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory with these. Um, amniotic membrane, you know, see how deep and thick that one is. You want this to heal. You don't want recurrent erosions. Those are my opines. That's how I opinionate it. And that's what I would tell you to do. And I'm going to close, I think, on this picture because I just love this picture. This was a patient of Dr. Derek Cunningham. Um, Derek basically was practicing in El Paso, Tejas. This is a patient who came across the um, border from uh, Mexico over the Freedom Bridge there. And Derek tells the story of him coming in. You know, he, Derek worked at the emergency room at El Paso with the ophthalmologist um, residents, and he was basically he trained them for all intents and purposes. So, and Derek's down in Austin with uh, um, Dr. Stephen Dell. And Derek tells the story about how this guy came in around 4, 4.30 in the afternoon with this nail in his eye. And, you know, as I recall, and it's, you know, it's, it might be an urban legend. And you know what? If it's an urban legend, people, I don't care. Is that because I showed this picture to my kids. Like when they were like, when they were younger, I mean, they're old now. I don't, I try not to talk to them because they're more expensive now. They're in their 20s. Um, um, hello? Dad? No, um, I don't have any kids. There's no dad here. Um, who does new phone? I, I keep trying, but they keep coming back. Is... I used to show this picture to them when they say, oh, I don't want to make my bed. Or, <laughs> and I'd be like, you see this guy right here? Like, yeah. 4.30, he walked in. There. He showed up at work at 5 in the morning, picked up his nail gun, and was looking, <laughs> shot himself in the eye. And did he go home? No. Did he not want to make his bed because he was tired? No. The guy worked the whole day. Now, the prologue to the story is that he had no major arteries or anything. It just went through the muscle cone fortunate but yeah i don't know what kind of pain medication i would give this person i don't think there's anything okay um i'm gonna skip this case because this basically goes back to what we talked about before no stain no pain nothing going on it's just the person's got neuropathic um and we're going to deal with everything we can so um i want to say thank you guys for staying on paying attention 